Footprints presents Bridge Builders, a series featuring people who've been promoting exchanges and understanding between China and Britain. Welcome to Bridge Builders. We've been meeting inspirational people who've increased understanding between China and the UK. Today, we introduce you to Frances Wood, a British woman who has surrounded herself with books for most of her life, among them some of the most precious and important ancient Chinese manuscripts. I'm Frances Wood, and for a very long time, for 30 years or so, I was head of the Chinese collections in the British Library. So my whole sort of working life has been to do with Chinese books. And then in my spare time, I'm, I used to amuse myself by writing books about China um, to try and introduce Chinese culture to people in the UK and Europe. Francis was born into a family of linguists, people who loved studying foreign languages. In her childhood and teens, she mastered French and Spanish. So by the time she was thinking about what to study at university, she was looking for a new challenge. I thought going to university, I would do languages, but I, d I thought I didn't want to do French or Spanish because we had already reached a level at which we were very proficient, could read novels, and so I wasn't going to learn anything. And I thought I, I would like to learn a language that was as different and as difficult as possible. I don't know why I thought difficult, because I'm quite lazy, but anyway, I looked at Chinese, Japanese and Arabic, and I'm very glad that I discarded the ideas of Japanese or Arabic. I mean, I think, you know, for a woman especially to learn Arabic and hope to work with Arabic would be pretty tragic and pretty difficult. And in those long distant days, the late 60s, Japan too was really not a very sort of female-oriented society. And also I have found since, I mean, I do find Japanese politesse whilst admirable. I mean, I find it very difficult. Chinese seemed therefore a language that would be good to study. And of course, at that time, if you think, the sort of mid-60s, I mean, China was effectively cut off from the world. So it was like learning a language was a way into understanding a culture that was so little known. And I have to say, from the moment I began, I've just loved it. It's the most fascinating language. It's got the most wonderful vocabulary. The way people look at words, colours and things like that are different. Every day I learn something. I learn a new character, I learn a new word, a new twist on human variety, if you like. Um, Chinese has just been an endless wonder for me. In 1971, after Frances graduated from Cambridge University, she was able to visit China with the first British youth delegation allowed to enter the country for a long time. We were treated in a strange way, rather like kind of honoured guests. I mean, we had our own railway carriage, which they used to stick onto the end of trains and take us off here, there. And we went to all sorts of wonderful places, places nobody would go now. Hong Chi Chu, the Red Flag Canal. It was unbelievable. The thing about knowing a little bit of Chinese was a wonderful opening for me that I remember being in a village near the Red Flag Canal, staying with one of our party who was ill, so I, I volunteered to stay behind and help him catch up with the group later because of knowing a bit of Chinese, I mean, not much, but going out into the street and being followed by a great crowd of peasants who'd obviously you know, not seen foreigners or not close to, and they asked me if I'd eaten which, I mean, as you would know, in China, it's just like saying, how do you do? How are you? And you just say, fine, yes, I've eaten. But I, not knowing that this was a way that peasants said, how are you? I launched into a great long list of what I'd eaten and, you know, um, that we'd had, you know, chicken, we'd had duck, we'd had this, that and the other. And everyone looking at me in a rather kind of dumbfounded way. It was incredible fun, just finding that I could actually speak to people. Um, and that they were friendly and funny and amused by me. And so it was an absolute revelation. I loved it. As one of the few Western visitors at that time, what were Frances's first impressions of the country she grew to love so much? I remember Peking. I mean, Peking was more like a village almost. You could wake up in the middle of the night in the Peking Hotel, look out of the window and see flocks of sheep being driven along Chang'anjie. You could see camels pulling loads in the outskirts of Beijing. 
It was a very different place. In the early 70s, it, it, people even in sort of Peking's central, in Wangfujing, the great shopping centre, people would sort of lurch backwards when they saw a foreigner. Old ladies would clutch at trees at kind of the sight of a foreigner. In villages, children would run away shrieking when they see a foreigner. I remember that in Jingangshan, for example. Um, you know, they were absolutely terrified, never seen anything like it. You know, of course, now with things like television and, you know, people are just completely used to foreigners and the way that they look and of course people's dress in China has now become very similar to ours so that's nice that one can be a bit more anonymous in China than in the old days when one was almost a, a sort of traveling circus my goodness the foreigner people used to say why Warren why Warren you know as if you didn't know that you were a foreigner when Frances returned to the UK she got a job in the library at SOAS the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. It was wonderful to be surrounded by students and teachers speaking Chinese and being able to choose books about China to equip the library. But Frances was still keen to improve her Chinese spoken language, so she returned to China in 1975 on a British Council scholarship for a year. And not long after I came back from China after my year, I moved from SOAS to the British Library Chinese section. A chance really to handle the nation's most important Chinese collections. It was a collection of oracle bones, jia gu wen, and above all there was the great Dunhuang collection, the great mass of material that had been brought back by Oral Stein from Dunhuang, um, come to England in 1910. And that material in particular really was crying out for work. Things had been done over the years to the Dunhuang collection, but really it required a kind of a massive input of energy, money and, and time to bring the whole of the collection into the open so that scholars could use it. Dunhuang in China's northwestern Gansu province was once a frontier garrison on the Silk Road. It's home to the incredible Morgao cave complex, sometimes known as the Caves of a Thousand Buddhas. Because of its dry conditions, Buddhist frescoes and artifacts have been preserved in the caves from as long ago as the 4th century AD. For 17 centuries, the 735 grottos of the Morgal Caves have been protected by the extreme dryness of the surrounding desert. For over a thousand years, monks carved elaborate shrines in the cliff face with funds from donors. Inside, the artwork showed how the Silk Road brought east and west together. Buddhist statues with elements from ancient Greece and Phaetian, Hindu and Buddhist goddesses with wings like angels. By the 14th century, the caves had been abandoned. But in the 1900s, the major powers of the world raced to Dunhuang, sending explorers like Aurel Stein. A secret cave had been discovered, filled with Silk Road manuscripts. And this time, the whole world was watching. In 1900, a walled-in enclosure was excavated by Wan Yan Lu, a Taoist monk who had long been a custodian of the caves and the treasures contained within them. Inside were thousands of priceless manuscripts dating from the early days of Chinese Buddhism. In return for helping pay for restoration, Wang sold some of the manuscripts to foreign scholars. Thousands were brought back to London by an archaeologist called Oral Stein in 1907, including what's known as the Diamond Sutra, an incredible scroll described as the first dated printed book in the world. This remarkable manuscript and other treasures taken from the Morgau Caves would keep Frances Wood busy for a large part of her career. Opening up the Dunhuang collection consisted of, of two main parts. Stein brought back about 7,000 complete scrolls. Many of these had been repaired in the British Museum in the period from 1910 up to 1970s. And the early restoration was really pretty poor. So one project was to embark upon a re-restoration, if you like, of the scrolls. 
But to me, the most significant area was what was called at the time when I started, it was called the Stein debris, you know, like rubbish almost. These were boxes full of crumpled pieces of paper. I suppose I led the charge in finding money and finding help in opening up all these, what we then called the Stein fragments and were able to invite Chinese conservators to come over to work on the pieces. It could have been done in-house, but our conservators, I mean, they're all English people, they were very good workers, they were absolutely brilliant, but they didn't get anything from opening up a Tang Dynasty piece of paper. You know, they didn't even know which way up it went. Whereas for a Chinese conservator, to open something up and say, goodness, this is even pre-Tang, this is possibly sway, look at the, the way the characters are written, or look at what this says, this, this is an imperial ordinance, this is, you know, a piece of a census and so on. For them it was much more interesting. And so what happened was that over, I suppose, a period of about five years, we had Chinese conservators coming. What they would do was very gently flatten out these paper pieces, and then they were eventually what we called encapsulated, but it wasn't, it's not real encapsulation. They were sewn into plastic folders. The great thing about these wonderful plastic enclosures is that people can handle them. You can hold it up to the light, you can look at the chain lines on the paper, you can look in, at the fibres in the paper. You can handle them without actually damaging the fragment inside. So, and we ended up with an extra 14,000 items added to the collection, all of which can now be seen by visitors who want to study the Stein collection. So it was very exciting, but my life was completely tied up, I would say, for Oh, about 15, 20, 25 years, looking after just not Dunhuang fragments, but also the conservators and scholars who came to look after them and to look at them and to work with them. So it was a very sort of Chinese life, if you like. All composed things are like a dream, a phantom, a drop of dew, a flash of lightning. That is how to mediate on them. That is how to observe them. The original Diamond Sutra was written in Sanskrit. That was a translation into English by Plum Village. We know the Chinese version found in Dunhuang was commissioned as a woodblock using printed technology by a man called Wong in May 868 AD. The document is dated. Historians believe that Wong made this printed copy of the Buddhist Sutra as an act of honor for his parents. It's called the Diamond Sutra because its teachings were so profound. Buddhists believe they cut through illusion to reveal an ultimate truth. As well as beautifully drawn Chinese characters, the Dunhuang manuscript has an illustration of the Buddha talking to Subushu and other disciples. There's what appears to be a bear in the foreground and a repeated flower motif. The scroll is about five meters in length and made up of seven strips of yellow scroll paper. Being the custodian of such an important object was something that Francis Wood was immensely proud of. I think the Diamond Sutra is certainly the most important book in the entire world or the most important printed object in the entire world. If you think of what people say about you know, the advent of printing, the importance of printing, what print has meant to us, the Diamond Sutra marks step one on that road, and it is a very beautiful item as well. It was printed in 868 AD, which is 500 years before Gutenberg. It's printed on paper. Paper in, was invented in China in about in the early Han Dynasty. I mean, both of those aspects, paper and printing, are Chinese firsts and deserve to be celebrated. I would also say, though, for me, one of the things about the Diamond Sutra is its extraordinary beauty. If you look at the characters, we are very used to Song Dynasty style characters in printing, which are very narrow, sort of tall and thin, if you like. The characters that you can see in the Diamond Sutra are wonderful square, they're very strong, they're absolutely beautiful. I think we should all emulate that style, Tang Dynasty style of printing. So it's a very, very significant item of world history. It must feel incredible to be able to handle something so priceless and to be able to have it restored to a condition where scholars can learn something about our past. You're concentrating on something which is of world significance, 
and each person brings their own special talent or expertise to it. And someone like me can just watch and, and learn and marvel at the skills of both conservators and academics. Projects that bring people together are absolutely ideal when you've got a common goal, the exploration of something. Phil Adlon does it with his films about conservation, you know, following up fantastically important conservation projects in China, which will have significance for everybody. In any project, you learn something that you can take further, and it means that each person's skills are enhanced. And bringing people together on a project is a very joyful and pointful and useful thing to do. Francis Wood is talking about the documentary films of the British filmmaker Phil Agland. His 1994 Beyond the Clouds was filmed in the charming Lijiang in Yunnan and showed people in the West the beauty of the Chinese countryside along with this wonderful soundtrack. Every day for hundreds of years, the people of this mountainous area have converged on the old market town of Lijiang. From the 1300s until 1723, Lijiang was ruled on behalf of the Chinese emperor by the Mu clan. The issue of returning cultural treasures to their original homes is a controversial one in the museum world, and very topical. In the UK, there's been a long-running debate about whether to return a collection of classical Greek marble sculptures, known as the Elgin Marbles, back to Greece. The sculptures were taken from the Parthenon in Athens to Britain in the early 19th century and are on display in the British Museum. So what does Francis Wood think about historical artefacts being returned to their original places of creation? If the Diamond Sutra was returned to China, I would be delighted. Um, I mean, I've had the privilege of being close to it, well, for about 30 years, and to, to know it very well and to have watched its restoration by our conservators. And I think we can feel a pride that it's been beautifully treated in the UK. It, it had been backed many times rather badly, but Mark Barnard, our curator, he spent something, oh, seven years actually peeling all the backings off and restoring the Diamond Sutra to the form that it was in when it was first printed. You can actually see the imprint of the printing blocks now. It's in wonderful shape, so I think we could be quite proud in handing it back to China and say, look, this we have looked after very well. As for the rest of the Dunhuang collection, she's not so sure. For the rest of the material, I think I feel less certain about it, if you like. I think one of the questions of, with repatriation is, where do you send things back? I mean, should they go to the Chinese National Library? And the British Library definitely tries to really to open its, its doors to Chinese scholars if they want to come and see the Dunhuang material. There is also the question of, of putting things up on the World Wide Web, which we did pioneer, but is now happening with the National Library collection, the French collection, and so on. So scholars can now, on their computer screen, see the Dunhuang corpus. And I think that's very important. They don't even need to travel as far as their own university. They can see it on the screen. And I think that is a way of conserving originals and making the content available to far-flung scholars very easily. I think that's important. So I think with repatriation of cultural treasures, one has to look at the value of individual pieces plus the usefulness of the mass. And I'm in favour of digitisation, digital scholarship for the mass, and then singling out the special pieces like the Diamond Sutra. New technology has provided an incredible opportunity for scholars wanting to get up close to look at artefacts and ancient manuscripts and to share their research. Francis thoroughly enjoys bringing people together on a large project to preserve an ancient object and to find out more about its history. I think bridge builders are fantastically important because they, they get over the last little problems that there are. That, you know, what is it that's holding someone back? A bridge builder builds the bridge and shows the person that you can get across. I mean, I talked about sort of breaking down barriers 
but I think bridge building is a nicer way of putting it, that a, a bridge builder shows someone the way to what they want, and what they want is to understand people on the other side. And um, understanding on both sides is what bridges are for. But I think any bridge builder is welcome. You know, I think from either side, the point is anything that improves communication between our two cultures, makes it easier, makes it happier, that's always a good thing. Frances's love of the Chinese language gave her the tools to forge a fascinating career, surrounded by incredible artifacts and interesting people. She hopes to inspire a new generation of Europeans to learn the Chinese language. Learning Chinese does help enormously in understanding Chinese culture and Chinese history. And also learning about Chinese culture and Chinese history is also fantastically important in understanding about China. The language itself is just a very interesting language. I think people are unnecessarily afraid of it. I think more European people should take up Chinese and not be scared. It's not actually that difficult. It's just different. When you start learning Chinese, you've got nothing that helps you from English. So you've got to learn everything. But that's fine. It's just harder work, perhaps. I think one of the things I've felt very strongly about is that people should realize with Chinese that you can easily acquire a vocabulary in a certain area. You know, that if you are a specialist and you're interested in, you know, medicine for old people or something, if you learn Chinese, it's not at all difficult to quite quickly get to the point where you can read Chinese scholarship on your subject. You know, you can acquire that vocabulary. You wouldn't be able then to read poetry or read books about ceramic manufacture or something. But it's not difficult to acquire the appropriate vocabulary in your own area. And that really will open specialists up to a much broader interest in their own field. Going backwards and forwards to China and truly understanding a language and a different culture to her own has been endlessly fascinating for her. Understanding and empathy are, are absolutely essential to the human experience. And I'd almost say, you know, we don't have to just consider China, consider anywhere else. When it comes down to it, we are all human. We are all exactly the same when it comes to kind of utterly basic feelings. Um, and what we have that is different is cultural. So understanding culture means that we understand the subtle differences that there are between us and understand that they are subtle differences, that they're not crucial differences, I don't think. The crucial thing is that we are human. I mean, as many of our great writers and your great writers would say, you know, if he pricks me, do I not bleed? I mean, that kind of universality. And just to see the difference that culture makes is absolutely fascinating. I love the way that, you know, you can have that, you know, Chinese people do treat older people in a different way. They treat them with far greater respect than we do. And yet sometimes, as an older person, it can be a bit oppressive. I mean, when I'm in China, you know, if there's a one single step, I get helped up it. And I think sometimes I can manage, you know. <laughs> so Chinese people need to understand that British old people like a certain amount of independence. And we have to understand that, you know, Chinese old people like to be supported. So that's, those are very subtle differences between us. She advises those wanting to understand more about China to try and read Chinese literature in translation. There have been a few movies like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Hero and Fearless, which have been successful worldwide. A few Britons have read a Chinese literary classic. I think people will like it. There are wonderful things, but I suppose there are sometimes difficulties. It's like if you take The Dream of the Red Chamber, Cao Xueqin. I mean, there is a fabulous translation by David Hawkes. But it's quite funny, it's quite difficult to find often in bookshops because people file it under X because they, they think that Xueqin is his given name, not Cao. I mean, we have problems of, about names and Xs and things like that, but we must get over them. We must make it easier for British and European readers to read Chinese works. France is better than England, actually, I should say. A lot more contemporary Chinese fiction, particularly, is translated in France, so I quite often read it in French. 
So, Francis Wood says some non-Chinese speakers can get confused about the way Chinese words are put into pinyin, never quite sure how an X should be pronounced or whether a family name should come first or second, for example. As a bridge builder who spent much of her life surrounded by some of the most incredible artefacts from the Middle Kingdom, Frances Wood hopes that more people in the UK will want to visit China and to find out more about its incredible history and civilization. I think it's fantastically important to educate British people about Chinese history and culture because China is there, because China is important, because we ought to try and understand, but also because if they're anything like me at all, they will just find it so endlessly interesting. China is a culture which presents a different view of things. It's not a hostile view, it's just sometimes slightly different. Looking at landscape in a slightly different way, placing oneself in landscape in a different way, it's just endlessly fascinating. And we deserve respect, and the Chinese people with their own culture also deserve respect. And I think the more you learn about a different culture, the better both sides are. You've been listening to Bridge Builders with me, Louise Greenwood. The readings of the Diamond Sutra were by Quan Chen Chen. The series producers are Elizabeth Mins and Sun Lan, and the sound editor is Terry Wilson. Mm-hmm.